good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everybody. Am I live? Can you all hear me all? Quick yes in the chat will help. Yes, great. Pamela wins the prize this week for the first to respond. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So nice to see you all with us here today. Thank you for joining. Thank you to all of you, our community of friends and colleagues all around the world. We appreciate your time. I hope everybody's okay today, wherever you are. Please feel free to use the chat to identify where you are, how you're doing, what's the situation in your country, and what's the situation in your community. And uh, welcome back to our little community here. So welcome to this. This is the eighth of Sid Joe's Jewelry Industry Voices webinars with me, Edward Johnson in London, and also my colleague Steve Benson in Tel Aviv, head of Sibjo Communications. So as always, we expect this webinar to last one hour. As always, we're going to struggle to do that because as always, we've got a fantastic topic and a wonderful lineup of panelists to educate and entertain us today. As we know, this series of webinars started back in mid-April, hosted by Sibjo, looks at the impact and also the implications of the COVID-19 crisis. But we look at it from the perspective of jewelry business leaders who we invite to speak with us each week. So let me ask you, have you been shopping online more for the past few months? Well, join the club. Last month, the consultancy Bain said that despite the expected second quarter slump in global sales of luxury goods, online luxury has remained resilient and the crisis will speed the shift to digital shopping. It's expected, digital shopping is expected to reach 30% of sales by 2025 and that's up from 12% in total in 2019. Now, actually, one of our panelists today, Mithun Sachetti from Carrot Lane in India, he told me recently that he's seen jewelry retail changing rapidly during this pandemic. He, he told me that Tanish, which is partnered with Karen Le Carrot Lane in the Titan and Tata business group in India, Tanish saw the same amount of e commerce sales in one day in April compared to the whole of 2019. They did more business online in one day compared to the whole of last year. Carrot Lane itself also experienced a 122% increase sales recovery rate in the first four weeks of opening their stores. So we can see that there is a clear importance of a strong digital first on the channel and physical digital strategy. So today, we're going to discuss what that means. We're going to analyze the importance of being consumer centric and of capturing and analyzing data to better serve the consumer. Before I check in with the speakers and introduce them, let's check in with Steve. Good afternoon, Steve. How are you doing? I'm well, Ed. Uh, and. Uh... Good day to everybody else on this call. Um, as always, I'm just going to give a few technical details of how we run this uh, so that um, hopefully it will go smoothly. Um, the, we don't, there will be um, the opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, but uh, we um, have learned that it's better that the questions um, be typed into the Q&A box. So you've got two boxes, you should be able to get two boxes on your screen. The one is a chat box where you can communicate with, uh, with the rest of the, um, um, the participants. Um, but there is also a Q&A box uh, where you can limit to questions that you want to direct to the panel. What we will try to do is we will, um, uh, we have retained a section at the end of the discussion for Q&A. 
And uh, although we cannot promise to get to all of the questions, we will try to pose as many as we can uh, to the people that we have with us. Um, they will also have the ability to, uh, to answer you directly um, um, in writing. Um, what I'd li like now to do is to, uh, to introduce the SIBJO president, uh, Dr. Gaetano Cavalieri, who will say a few words before we get this thing rolling. Uh, Gaetano. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to all the panelists and the, the attendees. I can see that the number is growing. Uh, today we have uh, this webinar on uh, uh, the e-commerce that I personally just, uh, I want to echo what Edward said before, uh, being uh, uh, for all my life quite reluctant to go into e-commerce, I have to, to, to confess that during this last month, I have used the internet quite extensively. I myself, uh, from uh, buying uh, uh, food at the supermarket or buying other stuff, uh, books or whatever. So um, I believe that uh, we are today in a world which has completely changed, not only because the COVID-19, but also uh, uh, through the COVID-19, and I want to remember all those that passed away during the terrible times, uh, and this is a big price that us and humanity has paid uh, uh, very heavily. But overall, uh, we still continue to uh, go forward with our activity on sustainability. And the future is uh, uh, in this moment already here because we are living the times of sustainability innovation uh, within the future. So I uh, welcome everybody to be with us and uh, clearly uh, we in Sibjo uh, are all at your disposal. And again, I want to thank our good friend panelists uh, from all over the world uh, because uh, we will enjoy what they have to say. I personally am enjoying very much and learning a lot. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Gaetano. Yes, that's true. We really are learning a lot, aren't we? Every week, a different topic and some fantastic panelists every time and this week is absolutely no exception so let's get to our panelists today so firstly alan chan alan is the general manager of the group branding center of the chow tai fuk jewelry group which is asia asia's largest jewelry retailer alan joined chow tai fuk in 2010 and he's now responsible for the branding and the marketing management of the group. Good evening, Alan. It's quite late, nine o'clock at night for you there in Hong Kong. Yes, good evening and, and hello to everybody. Um, I'm Alan, I'm from Chow Tai Fook. Our company's main market is in uh, mainland China, but now I'm in Hong Kong because we're being locked down. And uh, most of my team members, they are, they are still in mainland and um, some of them are joining us today. So I would like to take this opportunity to, to say hi to my friends. <laughs> Lovely, thank you, and welcome to everybody from Chow Tai Fook today. Next, L. L. Hill is an award-winning entrepreneur and now a strategic consultant to the diamond, gemstone, and jewelry trades. And she specializes in omnichannel marketing. She has over 25 years experience in the industry and launched her consultancy business, Hill & Company, in 2012. El, it's a pleasure to have you with there up in the beauty of North Yorkshire. How are you today? I'm wonderful today, and I'm really happy to be here with Mifton and with Alan. I think we're going to have a great conversation about what has become a silver lining um, in terms of all of the learnings that we're going through right now. Thank you. So next, named among GQ magazine's 50 most influential young Indians, Mithun Sachetti is the founder of India's leading omnichannel jeweler. Along with his co-founder, he started CarrotLane.com in 2007, giving India its first 
online jewelry destination. Amithan hails from a family of five generations of jewelers. Good afternoon, Mithan. How are you? We're lucky to have you on two cameras today. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, honored to be here. Looking forward to a great interaction with everybody. And uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be late evening in Chennai. Uh, it's great to be back in business. It's been two and a half months of working from home. Great to be back in office this week. Great. Thanks. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for being with us, Mithun. So just a quick disclaimer before we get going with the questions, please note that none of the opinions or the information offered during this webinar constitute any legal, financial or official advice. Sidjo, as you know, a global perspective on the challenges we're all facing. So please, for more precise information, we encourage you to play an active part in your local trade association and seek advice relevant to your location and your business. Let's, go in with, let's get going with the questions. And um, really, we want to think how our businesses gathered today have responded to the situation and responded to change. So Alan, if I can start with you over there in Hong Kong and China. Sure. Tell us about, if you can, the, the on the channel strategy that Chow Tai Fook had prior to COVID-19 and how important was e-commerce to your business? Um, before COVID-19 and uh, I can start the story from, from about 10 years ago, 100% uh, of our sales come from what we call physical sales so in, in uh, 2010. At that time we had about 1,000 point of sales in, in mainland China. We started our, our e-commerce about 10 years ago, and uh, we, we grow our business both physically and, and also through the digital channels. And from our physical sales, we expanded our, our network and almost, almost double our size in the past 10 years. But our, our online sales had a, a much more uh, growth in the past 10 years. Right now, it accounts about um, low single digit to our group's turnover it has almost reached more than 200 million US already. It's a, a huge growth in the last 10 years. But still, we, we think that um, still lots of room to grow because in, in China, as you know, it's, it's very big. We are still not yet cover all the cities in China. E-commerce helped us a lot in covering our, our market. Yeah, you told me you have stores in, in 700 out of the more than 2,000 cities in China, or what's designated as cities. So there's still some growth potential there for your physical stores. But what, what happened during the pandemic for you guys and how did Chow Tai Fook change and react to that? Did you develop any new sales tools or promotional tools? What happened? I think it's um, uh, everything came very quick for the pandemic. In since um, late January, uh, uh, when, when the COVID-19 hit China, we closed down almost all our shops within one or two weeks. And also our factory was closed as well. That means we have no more stock going to, to the uh, uh, point of sales. And since um, uh, late April, some of our, our point of sales can resume their business, but our factory was still closed down then we need to think of some new ways to, to tackle the issue in a few areas. One, we rely heavily on our e-commerce. Even though our, our warehouse still closed down, we rely on our, our stock in different point of sales. That means if I, I sell my product in A city, the stock may be delivered from B city. The second two is um, we developed a um, mobile phone application. Our sales team use this application to send stock information to their customers through social media or instant message tools. Then the customers would respond and they communicate via mobile phone and they talk to each other and they complete the sales by our e-commerce platform. These are the new tools 
for, for us. But the most important thing or direction was to proactively reach out to our customers. And were we using standard systems to reach out or were you developing anything new? We developed our, our own system because we want to have a, a closed system to reach out to customer and the orders can di divert to our, our warehouse system. So our sales force has real-time access to our stock information. It, they, they can sell stock from different parts of the country. And how about for you guys, key opinion leaders? You were using them before and how did that change during the pandemic? We used them before, but it's like a communication tool. But uh, after the pandemic, um, the, what we call the KOLs become a very in, important tool. They're using a, a, um, a selling method called live streaming. So it's like what we had many years ago for TV sales. Mm. These KOLs, they do a live streaming programs on the internet and people can find it real time. We tried it a, a few times during the pandemic and the result was very good. For one or two cases, we can sell a thousand pieces in 10 seconds. So Whoa. it's a very impressive uh, result. It shocked us. And um, another thing is very important for these KOLs, they've got huge traffic. Sometimes when we, they do their, their live streaming, there are more than 10 million viewers at the same time. And this kind of traffic is very important when we do our online sales because the conversion rate is from, from a, a crowd of 10 million people and it converts to, to business. This is a, a very new thing to us and a good lesson to learn. A thousand pieces in 10 seconds. Wow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's impressive. And it's um, kind of quite shocked to us. And, <laughs> and we need to, to uh, replenish and we, we need to fulfill the orders. And, but this is a happy problem. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm a bit blown away by that. That's amazing. It's amazing statistics. Thank you for sharing. Let, let's turn to India now um, and Mithun. So you started Carrot Lane Mithun in, in 2008 and it was very much rooted in digital and online, digital first. So tell us, about, tell us more about your strategy pre-COVID and, and how that was affected during the pandemic. Um, you know, we're a um, digital first business and the way we look at the business is that um, there is a funnel and uh, the role of digital is to play at the top of the funnel. Am I audible to you, Ed? Yes, you're good. Yeah. No. At the top of the funnel is where digital plays a very, very important role for us. Um, so as long as that role is held by digital, the conversion depends on where the consumer really wants to go and how much of a money we were throwing across at the consumer, that journey was slow. And so we realized that 1% of people are gonna to convert to shopping online and about six, 7% of people will possibly go and convert in our try at home programs. Uh, we have a mechanism by which we reach out to consumers in their home for the five or six pieces that they like. And then we have a, we obviously have our stores, we have 92 stores. And then um, the rest, about 10% of them, we could possibly serve through reach out uh, for them, getting them into our stores. So our main, the main attraction for digital was to build desire. And uh, we would focus on that at the top of the funnel, bring them into either our, uh, into our carts online or into an appointment and try at home or move them across to our stores. Um, what was very interesting to see is that um, as the pandemic came about and we had possibly a lag effect to it because we could see it come in China in Jan and we got the pandemic only by March. And in Feb, we launched something called, um, similar to live streaming, we have something called Carrotly in Live. And uh, essentially it allows people to do one-on-one -on -one live chats and do squad buying with the, uh, with the Carrotly in stores. So for example, if you're interested in a piece of jewelry that we attracted you online, and the purpose of visiting the store was to come with your mother or your sister or your brother or whoever, or your fiance, you could now do that via WhatsApp call with two or three of you together, us on the other side, trying on the piece of jewelry and then taking that piece on live. So we were able to do squad buying using Carrot Lane Live and that was a big change for us. 
I mean, it seemed like a no-brainer, but um, uh, it took a, you know, we could only think about it when we kind of were in a lockdown and we thought we were going to go in a lockdown and we realized that we need to do something because it will be a while before the stores come back up and alive. And, and so that Carrot Lane live streaming or Carrot Lane live, was, was that your own staff that were doing that to your customers or were you using KOLs, key opinion leaders? So we have, uh, uh, so when, at the start, it was our own teams which were doing it. And as time went by, we realized we could have no team in the stores or in online. And so people were working from home. So we started encouraging our customers to start doing live sessions and send us videos. And we started sharing those with other customers and that would result in sales. What were you learning during that, during that period? What was the, did you notice a change in your customer's attitude? For sure. I mean, all the money that we spent, you know, we had, we had a VC funded company in the beginning, one of the most prominent VCs, Tiger Global funded us. And all that money that we spent to change habit did not happen as fast as what we've seen in the last two months. Um, the way conversion rates have gone up, the way people have spent their time browsing on the internet and, you know, spending time, improved CTRs, click through rates, essentially, on, on jewelry. Even though one would think that there is a pandemic out there, um, it might not be, discretionary might not be the most important thing on people's minds, but when you're sitting at home and you're safe, and when you feel safe in your mind, there is big parts of India which could go out shopping because it wasn't hitting all parts of India. It was obviously hitting certain parts of India and the other parts were just locked down to be safe. And uh, all of those parts were really enjoying uh, browsing on the internet, spending time using Carrot Lane Live, getting family together shopping over there, uh, it, customers enjoying sharing their images and videos with other customers as well. So it was a very interesting um, change in behavior that we could see that digital consumption would now finally lead to greater consumption on the physical world, uh, physical assets as well. Interesting. Thank you for that perspective, Mithun. L, I was going to come to you, but you've got a point you want to make. I have a question for Mithun. I'm wondering if both traffic and conversion rate increased. Both. 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 We're at 25% higher traffic in June as compared to what we were in June 2019. And at the same time, the, and it's not just traffic and conversion. If you're brave in a moment like this, your cost of acquisition is your lowest because nobody else is advertising. And Google anyways runs on an algorithm. So you'll get the traffic at one third the cost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, thanks. Well, let's thank you for joining. <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're known as a proponent of omnichannel marketing strategies. From your perspective, did you see any change or the companies that you work with, did you see that they were changing the way they dedicated time and resources between online and the physical? Absolutely. Um, right, right from multi-billion dollar businesses down to the single store operator. Um, it's been quite impressive to see how people have really changed tack and said, right, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And I'm going to figure out how I can still show up for my clients. They're still there. They're still having birthday. They're still having anniversaries. They still want to be the hero. I can't let them down. So I had it right down to single store operators, you know, calling when I did free sessions the first three weeks of lockdown saying, okay, I want to put pictures on Instagram saying, Bobby just bought this for you, Sarah. He loves you. And he's going to pick it up after my store opens again. I mean, some impressive creativity. Um, and I think we all kind of looked on with um, encouragement and a little bit of applause as Kendra Scott pivoted all hundred plus of their stores to be e-commerce fulfillment centers, um, you know, within the space of five weeks, enabling them to attain their pre-pandemic projections for sales. So I think as a whole, the industry has really embraced the fact that we got to change. Otherwise, it, it's, it's thrive or die. Mm. And Kendra Scott is a U.S. based retailer, right? Yes, it's a like a 550 million top line revenue, one of the fastest growing retailers in America. Um, you'd be forgiven for not knowing the name because they have a, about a 20 percent recognition rate, but they're they're rapidly growing. Oh, great, thank you. I, I think what we all agree has been the most important throughout this period, 
and previously if you're operating online is to think consumer first. So we, we don't want to really recognize the consumer experience all the time and, and staying with you, Al, your vision, we've talked about this, but what is your vision of that consumer journey to purchase? I mean, it, and it doesn't matter whether it ends in the store or online, but how does it start from your perspective? Yeah, th this is a very good question and, and one that I'm so happy to have an opportunity to answer because the consumer journey um, doesn't actually necessarily have a start point, but if we start somewhere, it's the idea that they want to buy a gift and perhaps that it's going to be jewelry. And then they go and start collecting information about who should I buy from, what should I buy, where should I buy it. All of this journey or, or uh, most of this journey is happening long before they set foot in a store. Um, after they get the information about who they should buy from, then they start interacting with the actual people that are selling. And it's not a linear journey. They definitely go two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back. Um, they receive the goods and then they hopefully become an evangelist for your business and they recommend it to other people, which gives other people the idea and the cycle continues. Um, our real job is to delight that consumer so that they will become a brand evangelist for the experience of doing business with us. But what we have to do is show up all the places along all the touch points along their journey where they might be getting information, getting ideas a large majority of these are online. So regardless of whether they ultimately purchase the product on your website, this is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is we have to be there during that 60 to 70% of the buying journey that happens long before they ever touch your store or your website. And, and, and you well know as well that many jewelers are, are not selling online and, and even some jewelers don't even have a website yet. They're still stuck in the traditional ways of doing business in the community. Now you've, you've said quite strongly before that, you know, if, if, if people are asking the question whether they should be online or not, they're already behind the curve, you know? Um, but when you work with companies wanting to get started, what can people do to get started online and building that digital footprint as you call it? This is a great question because it's not too late to start. Um, you must have a presence online. Um, I like to give this example of wanting to find a yoga class for my husband to go to and Googling and Googling and driving 45 minutes in order to find a place only to find out a week later that someone five minutes down the street from me had a yoga class. And when I asked, why don't you have a website? She said, oh, well, my business is too small. Um, so it's just a short analogy to say everybody should start somewhere. And number one is a website so that you have a destination, so that you have a dress um, and to simplify it because sometimes people don't start because they feel like it's inscrutable. It's the internet and I'm not sure what to do. Think about what you already know how to do IR in real life, IRL and translate it, okay? So if you're gonna open up a shop, one of the first things you're gonna need is a space right? And the website is your shop online. So start with your website and don't get too overwhelmed with all of the input, incoming information about how you've got to have social media, you've got to have email marketing, you've got to, got to, got to SEO. It's too much. Get your website up and running, get that running like a well-oiled machine, and then begin to build out from there as far as driving traffic to it, one step at a time if you're just starting. Thank you. Great advice for people wanting to get started online. But of course, we're talking to businesses that have been on online since their creation. And Mithun, coming back to you, you started as an online only platform. You, you grew out of that. But from your perspective and what you've learned over the years over there in India, what, what do you think jewelry consumers want from their jewelers? And is it possible to satisfy that entirely on a digital platform? Um, is it possible to satisfy that on an entirely digital platform? Yes, I think so. If I look at the NPS score of the digital consumer versus the physical consumer, I have seen many digital brands or direct to consumer brands which have higher uh, NPS scores. So I would like to believe that that is possible. Uh, in my opinion, what a consumer looks for, honestly, is uh, the first is sincerity. and. Um, that 
Um, to me, it's the single biggest uh, obligation that a jeweler has to the consumer. Most times, a consumer buys a piece of jewelry because it's an occasion in their life. It's either a birthday or an anniversary or engagement. Or I mean, 65% of our purchases are that. There's a gifting or a self uh, occasion orientation to the entire uh, business. And it's a privilege, really, for us, or as any jeweler, to be a part of that occasion of that consumer's life. And if you were to think of addressing that problem from that point of view, and saying that we will, we are invited to somebody's occasion, and can we show up with the best possible attitude? Can we show up with the best possible, um, you know, best possible environment that we can create for them so they don't have to worry about it? I think if we take our role that seriously, uh, that is the honest answer that a consumer is looking for. He doesn't really care beyond that. If he can deliver to that, I think, um, and that's what we really believe every single day at Carrot Lane. I keep reminding my team every day that you have the luxury of being a part of a consumer's life. In fact, I ask them all the time in the stores as well, how many invitations do you get for weddings or how many invitations do you get for somebody's engagement? Because that tells you how closely you've connected with the consumers. You didn't just sell a ring, you actually became a part of that occasion. So for me, that's the most um, important part, that how well do you connect with the consumer and how honest are you about making sure that that happens? Honesty is truly important. And I think we've been using the word in our webinars and I've heard it all across the world during this pandemic is displaying levels of empathy with every yes. situation as well has been critical. Driving empathy is a very, very important part. And I think because we don't, we can't take it for granted in online, we kind of tend to drive it a lot more. Thank you. Alan, turning to you in Hong Kong, and, and, and by the way, um, our friend Karina in Brazil is, is amazed at those levels of sales that you were having online, the thousand pieces in 10 seconds. Can you give us an idea of the price range for those pieces? So normally, from, from our um, historical data, the, the best-selling items, they are around like 200 US, more or less. That's the normal price point. Because people buy online, if it's too expensive, they, they would be quite hesitated. So normally, it's around uh, between one or 200 US. That would be the, the, most, the sweet point. Can you give us an idea of what some of the highest pr price points have been that you've been selling online? Uh, I think our, our record was some um, like uh, more than 10,000 US. It's a carrot ring. It's a, a um, uh, um, engagement ring. Hmm. It's a, a, a customer coming to our e-shop and, and asking for help. And I think it's very important to, to um, mention that for e-commerce, customer service support is very important. So it's not only people uh, would buy directly from, from your website or from your e-shop. We've got a, a team to need to serve the customer online. And for that particular engagement ring, it's because our, our sales team is using our time service to help the, the gentleman to, to come up with a, a proposal. And we completed that sales. Right, right. And we were talking earlier, well, you were saying earlier that China, of course, is a very large country. And even with your size and scale at Chow Tai Fook, you can't cover all of the country. So, you know, it, it's important to think about geography as being a potentially limiting factor um, when you're setting up an online platform. Do you believe that? a potential customer can be catered to irrespective of where they're located, either within China or within the world? I think um, um, China is it, so big. And um, for some of the what we call the second tier or even a third tier city, they don't have many what we call shopping malls or department stores. So many of the consumers, they still relied on, on e-commerce to buy most of their, their items, especially for, for luxury items. Some of the brands, they're still not even um, available in particular city. That's why e-commerce helped them to, to open up their, their, their views and they've got more choices. But when we first developed our, our e-commerce, we realized that logistic support is very important. Right now, we've got our, our logistics center in, in Wuhan. So it's just next to our factory. So we can dispatch our product 
directly to, to, from the, the factory and then to our logistics center. Right now, this logistics center, they can handle about three to 4,000 pieces of product every day. That's a very important for us to, to fulfill our orders. And it's like a, a direct proportion. The more business we, we get from online, the stronger support on, on logistics is. It's very important when, when we develop our, our e-commerce business. Okay, thank you. And let's stay with you, Alan, but let's shift the conversation a little bit to talk about data hmm. and the power of data, the need for businesses to really understand the consumer through capturing and analyzing and using the information that the consumer gives us when they're online. Hmm. And Alan, you know, with a mix of physical through your stores and also digital sales through your online, this, this digital hmm. process, how do you at Chow Tai Fook manage data? And can you share some examples as well of how this is impacting your business and your consumers? I think we can divide into um, three stages. For the first stage, we, we develop our own um, uh, information system to have real-time access to our, our physical sales. That means um, we can have real-time access to every store to understand their stock situation, to understand the sales, and also we have um, a business intelligence system to analyze such data so that we can replenish our stock almost every day. We can, by these means, we can minimize our, our stock turn because we can supply and we can replenish stock almost uh, once or some, some stores twice a day. So this is very important. We get data real time and analyze that and then put back our feedback to, to the factory. They can replenish to the stores. So this system is a, a very important foundation. And the second stage is about online. When we, when we started our, our e-commerce um, um, platform, we realized that data is very important. So we need to analyze um, uh, data. I think Elwin also uh, Mithin just mentioned. So it's like a funnel. So it's a lot of data, the traffic, the, the reach. For example, I've got uh, um, uh, 1 million viewers every day. And then how does it come back in terms of business? So this is the conversion rate. It's a very important data when we do our, our e-commerce platform. The third stage, we are still in this third stage, which is how we analyze um, data by customer. So it's like a, a perfect scenario would be it's a one-on-one -on -one marketing. So we understand um, what our customer need and we can supply the right product at the right time. And, and you were talking to me the other day about the traffic that you're generating when you're working with some of those big e-commerce platforms in China, like Alibaba and Tencent. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about that traffic that you're generating. Uh, like um, Eddie just mentioned, we started our e-commerce by building our own website, our own e-shop. That's the, the beginning. But then we realized that traffic is very important in e-commerce. We built our own website. We, we realized that the, the traffic is not enough. Then we go to different, what we call the big portals like Alibaba's, Tmall, and, and Tencent's eShop. So we are now working with more than 20 players to open our eShop in these portals. And when we work with them, their traffic is very important. So every day we, we need to work with them to generate enough traffic. And for example, uh, in, on a particular day, for example, the single day from, from uh, Tmall, that's the most important day in, in the um, uh, whole year's e-commerce. In last um, uh, single stay, the whole Tmall, not, not for Chartai Fook, the whole Tmall generated $37 billion sales. And for Chartai Fook, we, we get um, more than 26 million US that day. It's the power of traffic. Because in that particular day, the whole country is, is crazy for shopping. It's like the, the, the Black Friday in the States. Yeah. And yeah. That's the power of traffic. And then every player get the this, this share of bit of traffic, and then they, they need to convert their part of traffic to sales. And that singles day, that's 11th of November every year, right? 11-11 in China. Yes. El, you had something. Yeah, 
I was, I, I wanted to comment on this because this is where data comes into play, right? Traffic, there's a cost to generating traffic and traffic in and of itself is not as valuable as quality traffic. Because as Mithin quite rightly said before, you, you know, getting a whole lot of traffic that's going to bounce off of your site because they really weren't there looking for what you have is going to drive your SEO in the wrong direction. So I imagine that both Mithin and, and Alan are very well astute and their businesses are at making sure they're driving the right quality of traffic and not just looking at the metric of, oh, we have that many million, but we want that many billion. Um, we want the ones that we're going to have a higher and higher conversion rate. So the quality, the cost of the traffic um, is, is better and the conversion rate is better and it has knock-on effects throughout the business. Yeah, thanks. Um, I see we've got about 160 people on the line. We've been going 40 minutes. I see some questions are being popped into our Q&A box. So please continue with that. And if any of the panelists wish to answer any of those please feel free or we can get to them live at the end but um we've talked about the some of those traffic generating systems in in china and Mithun, let's turn to you in india you know we know about alibaba we know about tencent um is there similar setups um with those with those companies or online presences in in, in india i think you're muted at the moment Mithun. Uh, you're still muted, Mithun. Ah, there you go. Should be good to go now, Mithun. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go for it. Okay. Uh, like most things, India is about 10 years behind China. So <laughs> our, our GDP is about 10 years behind China and um, the evolution of uh, e-commerce also is about 10 years behind China. Um, that's just where we are. I think in about 2008, what is the GDP of China is similar to what that is of India. And if you look at all the big mall, like T-Mall and Alibaba and all when they all were created and what the revenue was then is where um, Amazon and Flipkart are in India at that stage today. Uh, so it gives you a sense of uh, what is the scale and size of business in India as opposed to this. But the heartening part is that the same growth rate is what we're seeing in India right now of what uh, was visible in uh, in China in those in 10 years back for the online platforms. So still early days, but uh, not seeing so much for jewelry specifically on the uh, platforms such as um, Amazon and Flipkart at this point. Hopefully going forward, you might get something more. Well, what you do have much more control on is the use of your own customer data. So how, how do you use that data to better serve your customer? Um, yeah, there are two purposes that uh, we look at data. One is to build efficiency and the other is to build scale. These are the two ways we think about data. Um, well, let me first talk about scale. Um, it's very interesting to use the digital platforms to go out and build scale. And I must speak about one particular thing that uh, Elle spoke of as well, is that quality traffic is the most important thing. We've taken our metric one level lower we don't look at the number of people who visit the website, but instead we were, we were more obsessed about looking at the number of people who discovered one beautiful one piece of jewelry on the website. And that's the traffic that we look at because uh, the top of the funnel is uh, can be fuzzy, but it's a lot cleaner when you look at it. Anybody, it's it's if you were to think of the offline world, it's who walked in and walked out of your store within five seconds, or who walked in and looked at a piece of jewelry in your store. And if that's the meaningful customer and the source that gives you that is the source that you really want to go after and build traffic from. Now, at this point, from where we are, we get about a um, uh, hundred thousand, hundred and twenty thousand people a day on our platform. And so we feel that there is with a population like India, there is obviously tremendous upside and scale available, uh, but it has to come with efficiency as well. And now let me talk about efficiency. As long as we can drive, um, you know, we have something we call C by R, which is cost to revenue ratios. As long as the cost to revenue ratios stay within a certain number that we are comfortable with, we will keep driving traffic for that. But the minute it crosses that on any channel, we kind of walk away from it. Today, in the post, 
or, or during COVID, I don't know which way I should call it post COVID or during COVID scenario, these numbers are very, very favorable at this point. And they're favorable across the globe, not just for India. I'm sure it's the same in China and I'm sure it's the same in, in US as well. Um, I'm not exposed, I, I don't have much about China, but I know for US for sure that these numbers are very, very healthy right now. It's a great time for anybody who wants to get into digital right now. This is a good time to get into it because the conversion has now walked into your favor. The consumer has walked in your favor to go and do that. Now, the third part on data, we're data junkies. I mean, we, ha we look at data in so many different ways. It must, sometimes I worry myself about if I'm a consumer, how much I know about, how much my company or any other company knows about me as well also. So for example, <laughs> If I get a sense, we know about a consumer's birthday, his anniversary, his kids' birthdays, we know everything about them. Along with that, we know when they start browsing again. When we are able to match these two things, we know the potency of this customer to come back and start shopping with us as well. So we are able to use all the, the power of all of this data and come back and then figure out what is the right communication we need to have for this consumer and bring them back. At the top of the funnel, when you look at what was called newspaper advertising or, um, you know, which I think is, uh, is defunct now, is uh, um, we could put QR codes for a long time because we'd keep debating internally saying, does this even work or does not work? And we realized over a period of time that other activities give far more QR code scans to us, which told us the activity and its utility for driving top of the funnel business, for, uh, I mean, top of the funnel traffic for us. And so we were able to walk away completely and say, we will not do newspaper advertising for the next five years and see what happens. And, um, and you know, I'm sure it's like a year now and we're not bothered about it at all. Um, it's not made any difference. The business still continues to grow. We're still like a 50% year on year growth company. And we've walked away completely from a very, very expensive channel only because we were able to use data for every part of our funnel. I'll, I've just given you two examples at the top of the funnel but um, that's possibly just to give you a sense of how we look at it and how we think about data. Good quality data will tell you that while you might grow a new consumer base, you must still be able to retain 40% of consumers coming back every year because every consumer has at least four occasions in a year in which jewelry can be important for one at least. And if you say you can do this for at least 40% of, of your consumers, there's no reason to believe that we're a sunset industry. It's just we need to know how to use that data. What, what, out of interest, what are those four times a year when jewelry is relevant? In India, this is more specific to India, yeah. the birthday, the anniversary, Diwali, which is a very, very big function, obviously, for us, Christmas is uh, similar uh, on, on the West. And the fourth one that comes is Akshay Tritya, which is um, uh, a festival that was there recently in April. And that's considered a very auspicious day to buy gold. It's, uh, it's the Valentine's Day equivalent that we've created for the jewelry business. And that, that was the day, April 26th, that you told me about yes. with Tanish having those amazing numbers. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, Mithun, I'm going to mute your line because there's a little bit of echo when I'm get up, but I'm going to move from you, one data junkie, to I think somebody who else is a data junkie, L. Um, I mean, thinking again about those, um, those new businesses who are wanting to get into digital now. How can they best embrace and implement a new online ecosystem? Okay. When, well, what I said before was about starting with your website, right? A lot of people think of uh, getting online as having a website and sending information out. Um, and that is part of it. And being able to transact online is part of it. But collecting information is super important. And that's the data that you're talking about. So if you're just starting out, it's, it's best to try and think, what do we do in real life that benefits and increases our sales? What information is valuable to us? And Mithin just said it. If we make sure that our in-store salespeople have conversations and create relationships where they can ask, when is your anniversary? Or, oh, you're, you're, uh, you're pregnant. When is the baby due? And they start getting these dates of these anniversaries. Collecting that information is super important. You now have another way to do it, which is online with your website um, and with your social media and the conversations you're having with them there. So as opposed to just putting up a website that's a brochure that's perhaps transactable e-commerce, 
make sure that you have data capture points and calls to action. You know, participate in this VIP invitation only cocktail event. Just put in your birth date and your children's birth dates here to get an RSVP special invitation. I'm making stuff up, but the but in terms of the examples, but the idea is to make sure that your website is not a one-way headlight, but it's an interactive sponge that invites communication and engagement and allows you to start collecting that data. So it has to be set up on the back end to collect it and display it with the right analytics. Thank you. Let, let's get fidgetal, everybody. That mix of physical and digital that, is, that we're talking about being so important. And Alan, if I turn to you, uh, you know, we're, we're entering this hybrid future where digital is an integral part of the physical and, and vice versa. Do, do you see that from your perspective? Is that the, the, next, the next era that we're entering into? Yes, I think um, people uh, always talk about um, what we call O2O, -O, online to offline. We think that it's, um, it's a two-way traffic. So it's um, our physical stores help us build awareness and is still a, a major source of, of um, our sales right now. But it's very important to, to like, uh, we discussed quite a lot today, the funnel. The funnel would be people get the awareness, get the information online, but then they can choose two ways. Sometimes they will choose physical stores to make the purchase, but they get, they get the data online. Normally people will get information from, from two sources, one from your website, but also the now, people in China, they, they rely on the opinion leaders. They need to search, oh, what, what's the style and, and how they look like, and, and they trust these KOLs. So it's a, what we call online to offline. But then the reverse is the offline to online. People get to your store, and for the next purchase, they'll resume that cycle again. They start again on, on the next purchase from online. So we, we think that is a very important uh, um, what we call the, the, the digital era. Uh, Haley is commenting that it's a great word, fidgetal. I, I, I really don't want to take credit for it. I believe that it was, um, I believe that it was made up by an Australian marketing agency in 2013. At least that's what Mr. Google told me. So, um, L, you know, for you, uh, when we're in this digital space now, where clicks and mortar is, is what you need to be to be customer centric. What does it mean to be millennial centric in the digital mm. era? Mm. Well, I, I want to address that millennial part, but I also want to say earlier today, you were asking if, you know, can you serve all your clients needs purely online? And yes, you can. Um, I agree with him, but I do think that you have more sales and you have more upside that you can achieve if you make sure you allow them to consume you however they want to consume you. And no one does this more than the millennial consumer, right? Um, they are absolutely, you know, looking at your website in the bath on their iPhone. You can be developing your relationships and getting information with them on their, on their iPad or shopping on their screen after they finish a Netflix show. So the, the walls and the ceiling and even the screens of the retail environment are gone, especially for that millennial consumer. And an important thing for them, a, a very important thing for them and something they've been taught um, uh, is that the strongest vote they have is with their wallet. So they want to pick companies that align with their world vision their morals, their ethics, their desire for responsible sourcing for mercury free mine gold, sustainability. So we must couple our messaging and make sure people are aware of who we are as an authentic, the human beings behind the businesses. Um, nobody wants a perfect shiny brand that isn't telling you, this is what we really stand for. And we put a stake in the ground. Um, that's hugely important for those millennials. And then making sure that you're having conversations about that online and engaging with open discussions, two-way discussions online. Okay. Uh, Mithun, if you can unmute, because I muted you for the echo a bit, but from, from your perspective, you know, you started as a digital only business, but within a couple of years, you started opening stores. And I think you said you've now got 90 plus stores around India. So, I mean, if, 
online is so important? Why, why did you open a bricks and mortar and, and why are other online only businesses opening showrooms now? You'll need to unmute Nathan. You'll need to unmute Mithun. It's on, I can't do it for you, I'm afraid. There was some button that you pressed last time that worked really well to get the volume going. No. Yes, you're back on, that's it. You're good now. Yeah. Okay. Um... The, um, we're talking about, um, yeah, buy the stores. Um, think about my favorite word, funnel. And, uh, you know, everything that online does is expands the top half of people who can see your jewelry. You're competing at the top of the funnel, not with other jewelers alone, but also with other product categories. And that's the job of the top of the funnel. Now the store, is and that really is what digital does it brings you demand generation so demand generation happens through digital and now you come slightly lower down and you have the carts which is the add to cart and where equivalent of add to cart is the store there is a consumer out there who is willing to buy your design but he's scared and he prefers to have a you know touch and feel and do that so we have three models for that, right? We have our online stores where you could go do an add to cart and then shop from there through our live and everything else. The second piece is that you could do a try at home. So those four or five pieces will come to your house. Some guy will walk over and in India, we can afford to send somebody across and he'll come across and then uh, you could have an explanation of why this is good for you and then make a choice on that. And the third option is that you walk to the store and when you walk into the store, the limited inventory that we cast stores are small. They're not very, very large. They're about 500 to 700 square feet, maybe 1,000 at max. And these stores carry the best sellers. And we have, we, we have a milk run, essentially. So every city has a milk run. So what you like and you want to see in your nearest location will reach the next morning over there. And that milk run ensures that our inventory stays efficient still. We went online to become more efficient. And so as long as we can keep our inventory turns at three and a half and above, I don't think we worry about the efficiency bit at all. Uh, what we really worry about is making sure that we can serve more demand and more consumers don't walk away because of a friction point that exists. So if a store solves a friction point for a consumer, I see an absolute role for that. And that's how we think about it. It's not a multi-channel business. It's a single channel or a single funnel business with multi points of conversion. Thank you. We, we, we really wanted to think about the future, I can see, but let me just jump quickly forward to thinking about the future. So what does what the future hold? We are coming up to the hour. We're not gonna hit one hour again, but we're gonna do our best. <laughs> but this conversation is fascinating, so I'm gonna continue. But um, Al, what, what's your perspective for the future of online jewelry sales? Okay. Um, that, that's kind of why I was raising my hand. I was thinking about the future, but I wasn't thinking about just online um, because what Nithin said inspired me also um, about the fact that the conversion rates that were also really plugged into this data because that's what makes us smarter as businesses and able to serve our consumers better. Um, but what I think we're going to find in the future is that the conversion rates in store are going to skyrocket. You're going to have this big opportunity to really create a delightful experience because if somebody actually is coming into your store, it's like going to visit a puppy, you're going to come home with a puppy. So, so the, the conversion rates in store, I think, are going to see an increase looking forward. 
online, I think absolutely the pandemic has accelerated the trajectories that everybody was already project, uh, predicting 30% by 2025. I think we would likely, we are likely going to blow those numbers out of the water because we, people have gotten away from thinking that you have to see, touch, and feel in order to know, like, and trust. They get that they can go online, they can get the jewelry, they can look at those five pieces, they can send back what they like or send it all back. So the comfort level of online purchasing has skyrocketed due to the pandemic. See, touch, and feel to know, like, and trust. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Alan, Alan where, do you, where, do you see the, where do you see the future for you guys as well? Is it as rosy for online sales for you guys? Yes, I think we are well, having um, both uh, what we call today digital. I think both channels would, would grow at the same time and it's relying on, on each other. For, for us, we cannot purely rely on, on one channel because um, um, for, for China, um, physical sales is very important and particularly for jewelry. It's a kind of, for, especially for to expensive items. People need that surface, need, need that kind of um, uh, touching. But digital for us is a wide coverage. We can cover a bigger area and lots more, more customers. And therefore, we we're still running on these two, two ways. But the interaction is the important thing. How we use online to help offline, but also offline to help our online sales. This is a, a, an important area for, for us to, to continue exploring. Yeah, thank you. We've got a lot of questions in here, and, and one which I'd like to turn to for, uh, for Mithun in India. We've, we've got a question here, Mithun, from Vineeth Sandaria, who asks, what would be an ideal price point for e-commerce sales in India? And, and what are the, some of the challenges jewelers in India need to tackle to be able to grow their business online? Um, I mean, with, if you look at India and uh, where it's growing, uh, the, the average Indian e-commerce purchase is in Indian rupees at about 1,200. Uh, if you were to take jewelry, it's still very, very high. I feel Indian average jewelry purchase is about 25,000 rupees for the benefit of everybody globally. Um, that's about um, uh, uh, $350. Um, at $350, we're too expensive, I feel. When I look at America and I see that uh, there's so much jewelry available at $199 and $299 that I feel like a poor country like India having an average price point such as this restricts access in a big way. And I feel that the real market creation opportunity sits at lower price points. Um, the problem is the logistics, the, the cost of that and everything in India is still very, very expensive. It's not like the United States. United States has that sorted very, very well. I don't know about China, Alan can add on that. Only 7% of Indians have ever bought a piece of diamond jewelry in their life. We have 65% of Indians who buy gold jewelry. So there is such a huge market available for gemstone studded jewelry to expand that yet, you know, his other question was about synthetics. And I'm saying that for this as well also. The whole opportunity of market creation or market access in India is far greater than the opportunity of serving the market in India. So while we might be 2% of GDP right now, the opportunity to build a new market in India is far greater. The have-nots in India are far bigger than the haves in India. And that's the population advantage that someone should think about while building the next wave, next wave of e-commerce business. Uh, thanks. We've got a question in here as well from Stefan Fischler, which reminds me that I need to thank Stefan as chairman of the Technology Commission for helping with preparing for today's webinar. So thanks, Stefan. But Stefan asks, and Al, I think this is probably mostly for you, this question. He asks, how important is language in the digital age? You know, we're thinking about the role of copywriters. Are they still going to be essential? And, and also, does AI play a role here? Mm -hmm. I think with regard to the copywriters, I think this goes uh, along uh, uh, every single aspect of what you're presenting on the screen. So when we talk about photography, 
I can get absolutely evangelical about the fact that you are selling photographs and you are selling words as well. So every, yes, copywriters are going to have even more of a job because what you have to do is be super efficient about communicating, you know, the story. Um, and that's going to be essential. Um, artificial intelligence is going to be essential in terms of being much more effective about how you're filling that funnel and how you're serving up dynamically what people want to see. So we definitely want to be able to do much wider testing that the artificial intelligence is going to be the only thing um, that is going to be able to give us that type of um, advantage that programmatic advertising gives us versus trying to ourselves who our audience is. So those, those two things are only going to grow. And to Mithin's point, um, shipping service providers have a huge opportunity now to up their game. And that's definitely going to be a growing category outside of our industry that will support us in all of this shipping of our jewelry. Thank you. We've got a few questions here. And, and Alan, maybe I can bring you in because, of course, you know, you represent one of the largest if not the largest jewelry retailer in the world, certainly in Asia. But we got questions from much smaller businesses. So what advice could you give small businesses getting started and even you know, pinpointing their customers, how they get started with working online and developing and shifting to an e-commerce platform? I think um, um, in places like China or Hong Kong, to, to set up a jewelry business in this part of the world, the two things are very expensive. One is infantry, and the other one is rent. And for, for online platform, we think that the obstacles for, for these two elements would be reduced quite a lot. So that means people can, can do their own startup online relatively easier to, to do physical sales. And the second thing is my, my suggestion would be to, to, to do the right segment. You can't do everything. You need to choose your own segment. For example, you're doing uh, a raw stones only or you're, you're doing uh, custom made jewelry and you need to be focused because in, in, especially in this part of the world, there are too many online jewelers already. So you need to find your own market space, target the right customers and also get the, the right, uh, what, what Milton today talked about, the quality traffic. So you can't get everyone to, to your funnel. Alan, while we're with you, you know, you gave us that at the start, that wonderful statistic of the amount of sales and the amount of seconds, which we're still reeling from. But we got a question here from Carleen, or is it Caroline Shad? And she asks, are our returns same as, as normal retail, for example, bad, um, or are they less? How do, you, how do you work your returns and how do you see them and how do you work them into your profit um, projections for returns is very one one of the very important aspects when we do our, our um, e-commerce we need to to have a very um, a trustworthy refund and return system so that means uh, some of the customers especially when, when when we did the case for for live streaming sometimes people are like impulse buying so the return rate would be relatively higher or much higher com compared to, to physical sales. That's one of the elements we, we need to, to account for. And also we need to provide strong support to fulfill our promise, to make our real uh, refund and also return if customers are, are not satisfied with their products. This kind of commitment and, and fulfillment are very important in, in e-commerce and it is much, much more important than physical sales. Okay, there's a question here from Anjum Cave, and I, I want to put this to Mithun because you, you, you talked about all the data that you have and sometimes surprises me how much you know about your customers. Of course, in Europe, we have a GDPR, um, which is a data protection regulation system. And what, what kind of issues do you see in India? And is there any regulations for data protection in India? Sorry, most companies which have a certain scale would follow the GDPR model and uh, would work with that. So anything that you know is anonymous and you don't know at a consumer's name, you don't know it at an individual's name, but that doesn't stop you from, and you can ask for rights for using it for that purpose itself. And um, so I don't find that GDPR, GDPR helps you from 
saving, I mean, helps a customer from getting spammed by a lot of nonsense. And that's really the purpose of it. And from being misused as well for any kind of fraud or something. And that's the intent behind it. If you can follow the same intent when you are going to market to consumers, I think uh, it's a, I mean, it's a simple, uh, it's a simple way to navigate. One was, one doesn't have to worry too much about it. One just have to have the right intent aligned to GDPR. Okay, thank you. We're 10 minutes past. There are more questions. We value your time. So I think we're going to bring it to an end there. Um, thank you. You've given so much fantastic information. We really do appreciate everything that you've done for us and all the information you've shared. Next week, we'll be talking about gemstone traceability. Is it a viable objective or it is an unrealistic challenge? And we've got a wonderful panel joining us. Same time next week, we've got a trader, Clement Sabah from Brazil and also from the International Colored Gemstone Association. We've also got the wonderful Haley Henning, who's a brilliant marketeer for colored gemstones for many years and now runs um, is the chief commercial officer for Greenland Ruby. We've also got a scientist, a lab scientist and a gemologist, Daniel Niefela from Gubelin Lab in Switzerland. And finally, and almost most importantly, the voice on the ground of the people digging stones out of the ground to enter the supply chain. We've got Cristina Viegas from the fantastic NGO called PACT. So please do join us next week. We'll look forward to having you with us. Registration for that will be available with an invitation that goes out to you tomorrow. And also you'll get an invitation from Zoom in a couple of days. Please also consider joining us for the webinars that Sibjo is also sponsoring by my wonderful colleague and friend, Rui Gallopin. We'll be talking about Amethyst next Tuesday, two time zones for that, 10 a.m. in the morning, so that it's comfortable for people in Asia, and 6 p.m. in the evening, so it's comfortable for people in the Americas. Please, if you're enjoying these, um, uh, these webinars, please sign up to get information about these and other issues from Sidjo. The communications email address is there. Um, we'd love to capture your data, as we've been told that's very important. So we'd love to get your email addresses and permission to send you information. So finally, it's just my role to ask Gaetano to say a few words. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you very much, the wonderful panelists uh, we have had. Obviously, on top of the wonderful panelist is L, because with all the due respect for Alan, and uh, me too, she is much nicer than you. <laughs> <laughs> but apart that, apart that, uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, very, very much because there was in the uh, uh, middle uh, of what you were talking about uh, a, a number uh, of elements which are consumer confidence, because if you do not take care of your consumer on the digital uh, market, uh, uh, obviously the consumer will never come back to you. Number two is your reputation, because the more high reputation you have, you can better serve your consumer in a digital way. Number three, services. So, uh, uh, I mean, I am not an expert uh, of all this kind of stuff. I am an economist uh, uh, specialized in other stuff. But certainly the fact that I can rely on uh, a, a company who is offering their products, which obviously has to be high quality standard, even though they cost $3, because it doesn't make any difference if they cost $3, $300, $3,000 or $30,000, because the quality of the service you give to the people is enhancing the quality of the revenue you get. So more quality you give in terms of consumer confidence, uh, uh, education, information, uh, reputation, transparency, sustainability, innovation and future, then the more you get. So I want to thank you very much for what you said. I am really happy and honored uh, to have had all of you with us 
and please come back again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaetan. And now we've had a lot of words today. Many words have been spoken, but I'd like to ask each of our panelists if you can just share with us one word, one word that describes the future of e-commerce for the jewelry industry. Mithun, can I start with you? It's a Latin word, gratitim ferocita. I am not good at pronouncing it, but I'll translate it. It's step by step ferociously. Well, we'll give you that because it's one Latin word, which means a few in English, but that's step by step ferociously. That's great. Thank you. Alan, can I turn to you for your, a one word description of the future? I would use some um, tropic because right now, both uh, what we call the digital world for both ways, for online traffic and also in our offline stores, traffic is, is most important. Traffic. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for being with us this evening. And finally to Elle. Boundaryless. Boundaryless. Hmm. Thank you for one word. <laughs> <laughs> Boundaryless. Great answers. Thank you all so much for your participation. Really enjoyed it. We've still got well over 100 people with us and we've gone well over the hour. We do apologize for taking 15 minutes extra of everybody's time, but that was a great conversation. Alan, L, Mithun, thank you for your time. Steve, thank you for your support. Gaetano, thank you as always for everything you do and that Sibjo does. We wish you all well. For those of you that are already out of your lockdowns, please remain safe. For those of us who are in England who are out allowed to create social bubbles now, those of us in UK know what that means, please enjoy your bubbling. In the meantime, have a great week and we look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. Take care everybody, bye bye. <laughs>